Well, I'd like to take just a moment and give a very brief introduction for our guest speaker today. For those of you who have not met him yet, uh, Pastor Charles Simpson is my pastor, my mentor uh, in the ministry. He has contributed more uh, to the formation of my theology and my uh, method of communication probably than any other person. And um, he's here with us today to share, and uh, I'm very excited to have him with us. And so if you would, please make your heart and your mind open and welcome Pastor Charles Simpson. Good morning. I'd ask you to join with me in prayer, please. Father, we thank you that every good and perfect gift comes from above. You've blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What we ask for at this moment is clarity of understanding, willingness of heart to see your will done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you for all of those who have given their lives so that we may have what we have. For those who've sacrificed in order for us to enjoy the freedom that we enjoy. For those who gave their lives to the word of God so that we may have it. Help us, Father, to be good stewards of the blessings we have received. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles and would like to turn with me to the book of Galatians in a moment, I will read from Galatians, the fourth chapter. I appreciate the honor to be here. I uh, enjoy fellowshipping with Pastor Duane and his family and many of you. And I, I want to say sincerely <clears throat> that I consider it a privilege. Anytime I'm invited anywhere, it's an honor. When I'm invited back, that's a real honor. So. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> my father was a minister and loved to tell stories and had a lot of funny and wise sayings as well, but he told a story about a guy that fell out the window and landed on the street. And someone rushed over and said, what happened? He said, I don't know, I just got here myself. And I feel kind of like that. Every day as I look at the world around me, I feel like I fell out of a window of yesterday and landed in the window of today and don't know how I got here, and I'm not sure I can say what happened. But I'm going to read from the book of Galatians from the fourth chapter, New American Standard. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time, there's a phrase, don't miss it. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ." In the fullness of time, now there's more than we're going to be able to cover or could cover in a month, but I'm going to talk about navigating the future. There, there is a truth that every technological change brings a societal change. The printing press changed every culture it touched 
when pe people began to be able to read books and articles and be informed. And then later, electricity changed how we live. If you've ever lived in a place without electricity, which I have, you understand that electricity is a blessing and it changed society. And then along came the uh, television and people could see visually how other people lived and then we had the internet which brought all manner of information to anybody who had a cell phone or a computer. It's changed more than we more than we realize. We've gone from analog or external structure to digital internal structure. We've gone from serving in a fixed position to being highly flexible, adjustable, and changing in a rapid, rapid way. I'm not sure that the church has prepared people for change. We love the past, at least I'm sure most of us do. We love our traditions, and we need to lo love the lessons that they've taught us and take the lesson forward, but you can't take the tradition forward. Now, it's not... I'm not saying you can't, you just can't. Change is happening so fast that we have to adapt without losing our foundation, without losing the truths that we've been taught, but methods are gonna change. It's a little poem, methods of many, principles of few, methods always change, principles never do. But we're in a time where change is happening so fast, it's hard to orient ourselves. Now I want to talk about Jesus for a moment. He was born for change. Thank God Jesus can handle what's happening, and he can help you handle what's happening. The Bible says in the fullness of time, he was born. Now, I always saw that as at the right time. But it means more than that. It means that that time had been fulfilled. Every age gets fulfilled. And when God's purpose is fulfilled in that time, another time begins. Help me, Lord. I believe we are in the overlap of ages. If you're familiar with the Audi symbol or the Olympic symbol of circles, we're in the overlap where the past is still with us and the future is dawning. The thing is, and I, I'm trying to be as succinct as I can, when change comes, uh, a change of ages, the past fights the future. The past wants to hold on. This is true on so many levels. It's true in your life and mine. It's true in government. It's true in technology. The past doesn't want to give it up because it understands that era. And the overlap is it's moving into an era it doesn't understand. The Bible says Abraham went out into a, a land he knew not. That's where we are. Now, there are a lot of people who tell you what the future is going to be. They just don't know. And there's a lot of projections that are going to be proven wrong and have been proven wrong. 
a lot of expectations. Now, the Bible tells us the overall plan of God. He just doesn't tell you when it's going to be fulfilled. So if you jump ahead and you're thinking, you may be disappointed, not because God didn't tell the truth, but because your anticipation exceeded his intention. You have to be careful about anticipating what's going to happen and building your hope on that rather than on the Lord. Amen. A lot of people have done that. They've done that politically. They've done it economically. They've done it religiously. The disciples said to Jesus, will you restore the kingdom at this time? He said, I don't know. He said, the Father has reserved that to his own authority. Now, if he'd just read some of our books, he would know when it's all going to happen. <laughs> but when Jesus says, I don't know, it's a good thing for us to say, I don't know. I know the Lord, but I don't know when this is going to happen and when that's going to happen. In the 60s and 70s, when the Jesus movement happened, a lot of young Christians wouldn't go to college because it said the rapture's coming. It didn't come. It didn't happen. And here we are, and there's consequences to our decisions. Whatever we do has consequences. And if we don't know what's going to happen, we become very dependent. I pray so. Now, Jesus was born in such a time, perhaps the most critical transition in all of history. Well, I believe it was. The scripture says that he brought about a completely new beginning. We move from law to grace. How many of you know that's a big change? How many of you are glad we're not under all the laws? 600 and something laws, religious laws, we moved from being just a servant, but to be a son or a daughter. To be moved from captivity to freedom. Now, these are all wonderful changes. They were moved from form to content. Now, he's, Isaiah said, you draw near to me with your mouth, but what? Your heart is far from me. Now, Jesus wasn't dealing with the forms. He was dealing with content. Jesus could handle sinners in reality better than he could religious people in hypocrisy. They were being moved from form and tradition to a whole new world that they didn't understand. And the people who could best receive it were the poor, the needy, the brokenhearted, the sinners, because they weren't ensconced in their traditions. It's better sometimes to have a past you don't like than a past you love because if you don't like your past, you're ready to change. If you're hung up on your past, you don't want to change, and you fight change. And those who killed Jesus were religious because they didn't want to change. Religious people are harder to change than sinners. That doesn't mean we should all go out and be sinners. But what it does mean is we have a bigger challenge if we've been Christians a long time, and we've done the things that we were taught to do, which were good. But form can lose its content just by repetition. And Jesus is restoring content. Form is what you're part of. Content's what's part of you. Being part of the club is not sufficient. The club has to be in you. We're coming to a time where our authenticity will be challenged and be tested. 
And remember, the past crucified Jesus. Religion crucified Jesus. I tell people addicts and sinners never hurt me. Not that that's good, but they never hurt me. But Christians like to kill me. I mean, I've seen, well, if you've never been on trial, you missed a blessing. If you've never been voted on, you missed a blessing. I've been voted on more times than once. And, you know, thank God. But <clears throat> you don't have to cuss to say bad things. Gossip is condemned along with, you know, there's a lot of sweet people that gossip. I got to get off that. This is not about gossip anyway. <laughs> Woo, my goodness. Plowed up a snake. Well, Jesus was born in transition, for transition, for a whole new way of thinking and living. The scripture says in Isaiah 61 that he was coming for the poor, the needy, the brokenhearted, the captives. The Pharisees memorized the verse but missed the message. You don't want to miss the message. Sometimes we miss a lot of clues. Marriage counselor told the husband, said, your wife says you never bought her flowers. He said, I didn't even know she sold flowers. You know, <clears throat> you can miss clues. Woman told her husband, said, why don't you do like our neighbor? He buys his wife chocolates and cards and flowers. He said, why would I do that? I don't even know that woman. Now, <laughs> You know, you can, you, <laughs> guy was asking for his daughter in hand in marriage, and father said, to the man that gets my daughter gets a prize. And the guy said, uh, what is it? You know, you can <laughs> mess up there. How many of you know there are a lot of clues out there right now that things are changing? Radically, radically. And when you're older, young people adapt to change pretty good. In fact, they go for it. But the older you get, and I can talk about that, you tend to like it the way it was. My whole thing is get it right and leave it alone. Um, but it's all changing. A friend of mine emailed me, he said, God rebuked me for, and he's a welder, he's a blue-collar guy, a good guy. He said, God rebuked me for looking at the container and not the content. That's one thing that's changing. You can't, you can't look at somebody and know who they really are. You can't judge a book by the cover. We're going to need more discernment than we ever had. How many of you know there's a lot of conning going on out there? You got a cell phone? You got a computer? You get messages that are lies? Oh, my goodness. I know people have been duped out of thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Fell in love with somebody they never saw before who wasn't who they said they were. Christians. How many of you know we need to be a little bit smarter? Jesus looked at Nathaniel and said, Behold, an Israelite in whom is no guile. Nathaniel said, How did you know me? He said, I saw you under the fig tree. Jesus didn't just look at him, he looked into him. We got to have better eyes. This is not a rebuke, it's preparation. Because that time has been fulfilled. I'm not talking about the virus. Yeah, it played a part. But all of my life has been transitioned. You see, 
Ages have longer transition periods. Two days, night is a transition. Ten hours, it's over, you're in a new day. Not this way. It could be a hundred years because you're talking about a thousand. All of our lives, change is happening. What's it about? What's it going to look like? You know about artificial intelligence, cars that drive themselves. Um, what do you call those goggles you put on and you see things in a different way? Wow. <laughs> we need some goggles. We need God's help to look out. Now, he's not going to show us all. He told the disciples, he said, I have a lot to tell you, but you can't bear it now. It takes a measure of maturity to hear what God has, and as you mature, he'll tell you more, but he's not going to drop the whole package. God didn't give a plan to the disciples. He told them some things that was going to happen, but he didn't give them the whole plan, didn't tell them when all those things were going to happen. But the past couldn't handle Jesus. So they crucified him. But he rose again. You know, reality will always rise again. If we deal with it in the wrong way, it'll always come back. And Jesus was crucified not by thieves and prostitutes and drunkards. He was crucified by religious people because they didn't like the change that he suggested. Does that mean religious people are bad? We shouldn't be religious? No. What it means is we can't crystallize and deal with the future because we're going to have to do some adjusting. We're, we don't have to throw away what we've learned but we may have to throw away the way we did it. Methods are many, principles are few. Methods always change, principles never do. The Word of God's built on principles, not methods. We got to know what changes, what doesn't, and how to negotiate the transition and deal with the fight yesterday has in our lives, all of our lives personally, as well as the culture. The good old days want to hang on. I love the good old days. I had some good old, I had some bad old days too, but I forgot those. I love the good old days. The problem is, <laughs> well, the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, they groaned in Egypt because they were in slavery, but when they got out, they thought, well, those are the good old days. They missed the barbecues, and we're out here in this wilderness, and they couldn't turn loose the past, and they died in the wilderness. I don't want to die in the wilderness, do you? How many of you want to make it through to the promised land? I do. I want to get into the thing I was born for. I want to be a Caleb, a Joshua. I don't want to die in some stinking wilderness. I, want to, I don't want to die not knowing why I lived. I don't want to die not knowing that there's something better ahead that I can press toward. How am I going to navigate the future? Let me, let me give some suggestions. Remember, God didn't give you a plan. He gave you a guide. We have a guide, not a road map. It's important. 
When you're going into the unknown, stay close to the guide, the Holy Spirit. Second thing, not knowing creates dependency and humility. When you know you don't know, how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you know you don't know? How many of you figured it out? You really don't know. As long as you think you know everything you need to know, you're heading for trouble. Pride goes before what? A fall. A haughty spirit before a fall. So we've got a guide. Realizing we need the guide creates humility. Listen, face the future with humility. The fear of God's the beginning of wisdom. I, I think it means the respect for God, the distance. Don't get too familiar with God. Don't let words become a mantra that you just say like hocus pocus. Ask yourself when you start to pray, what kind of mind am I dealing with? Take a look at the galaxies. And you're just looking inside the brain of God, I think. Aren't you glad he's mindful of us? I wonder sometimes why. I know he loves us. Thank God. But I'm in awe of God. I don't just sing about it. My, my brain fries when I think about who God is. He gave us a guide. Follow humbly. And obedience prepares us for the future that we don't even know. Let me ask you this. How many of you believe God knows the future? Uh, I do. I believe he knows the end from the beginning, the scripture says. I don't know the future, but if I obey him, I'm prepared for the future I don't know. If God tells you to do something that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, remember, he's preparing you for the future that you don't understand. You'll understand it better by and by, as the old song says. Later on, you'll look back and say, oh, that's why I did that. Obedience is preparation. Say it with me. Obedience. That's uh, kind of weak. Let's say it again. Obedience is preparation. It isn't just God wants you better morally. He does. It's that he wants you to survive and get into what he's called you for. And when you obey, you're taking a step in that direction. Another point, discipline is preparation. Discipline is not just punishment. If you've ever played sports and you had a good coach, you got discipline. If you had a good father, you got discipline. Not revenge, not... I'm not talking about sadism. I'm talking about Someone who loved you that knew where you would head, were heading and wanted you to get there. Somebody that wanted you better than you are in what you're doing and it requires discipline. If you've ever, how many of you played some kind of sports? Can I see your hand? Just raise that. That's good. My coach, when I was in high school, would be in jail today. He was a great coach. We had championship teams. But he didn't mess around. He didn't go out on the field to be your buddy. <laughs> he didn't know a thing about self-esteem. Never heard of it. It's a religious principle in our culture today. The Bible says esteem others better than yourself. Philippians 2. But we're, we're so worried about hurting somebody's feelings. Listen, the Lord, Hebrews 12, those whom he loves, he chastens. And he chases them because he loves them. So look, if, if, if you get discipline, if God's dealing with you and you're having some adversity in your life, embrace it as something to help you improve and be an overcomer. You know, 
It's wonderful to be an overcomer, but you got to come over something. Everybody wants to be an overcomer and not have to overcome anything. <laughs> I had a prophecy over me, oh, I don't know, 30 years ago. The guy is a beautiful word from Isaiah 59. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. I thought that's great. No weapon formed against me will prosper. But I didn't realize weapons were going to be formed against me. I missed that part. To overcome, you've got to deal with stuff you don't want to deal with. Chastening is preparation. Try saying it with me, all right? Chastening, let's say it again. Chastening, I know this is not popular. You're not going to be taught this in school and maybe not. Anyway, the fact is, it's healthy. It's healthy. And remember, most of our brothers and sisters in the world and other nations have to deal with adversity far worse than we do. I thank God for them that they have the grace to go through it. Another thing, faith produces endurance. There's so much in the Bible about endurance. Don't throw away your confidence because it brings great reward, Hebrews tells us. Believe in it. If God's shown you something, he's told you something, believe in it unto death. How do you know you have faith? To me, the greatest evidence of faith is peace. If I'm trusting God, I will not be anxious. The moment you start getting real anxious and upset about what's happening, you've lost your peace and you've lost a degree of trust. My dad used to say anxiety is a minor case of atheism. You wouldn't want to be, a, you wouldn't admit to being, none of us would, an atheist. But when you start to get anxious, you're acting like there's no God. Faith will help you to endure. If you're going to get there, you're going to have to endure. You're going to have to overcome. By the grace of God, we can. One more thing. Have friends that you can trust and fellowship with. I'm a great advocate of small groups, clusters of people who love each other. There's an old saying, you can tell who you are by your friends. There's a lot of truth to that. But, but here's, here's the thing. We need friends and spiritual family to get through what we've got to deal with. Two are better than one. A threefold cord is not easily broken. If one is alone, how will he keep warm? If he falls, who will lift him up? The scripture's full of, of telling us to have good friends, spiritual family. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I will be in the midst. It doesn't have to be two or three hundred. It just needs to be real rich fellowship. I had a picture of a pile of burning coals and a man with a rake raking them apart so they'd cool off. I mean, even though that's what the devil's doing. He's trying to separate people. A lot of people have lost relationships. They become bitter at people they loved because this or that happened, something relatively minor has raked them apart. We can't get together, you know. It's, it's not permitted to get in a group together in some places. Thank God it's easing up a little bit. But isolation is devastation. Find some friends. You probably already have some people that have integrity, people you trust, 
Trust is the great commodity that's being lost. Trust in the government, trust in different people, trust in what's online, trust, trust. Find people you trust. Trust Jesus. Be with people that trust Jesus, and you can trust them, not just religious people, but people that walk in integrity. Be together. Jesus will be in the midst. He'll give you life, and he will encourage you. Instead of falling by the wayside, you'll make it into the land. You can navigate the future. If you hear the guide, if you walk humbly, if you obey what he's telling you, if you embrace chastening, not some strange thing that happened, but something God's using in your life, you can get better or you can get bitter. Find people that love you. It'll be there. You love them. You walk together in harmony. Jesus keeps showing up. And he's transforming you. He's telling you more because you're matured more. And you're getting ready to inherit what he had for you all along. Couldn't tell you when you were a child. But now he can tell you. Don't try to take the past into the future. Follow the guide. God bless you.